Yes. Or is it Oliver? <laughs> <laughs> we're at, well, Francis, we're actually going to do a double team. Um, so uh, hopefully everything will be seamless and smooth, but um, you never know in Zoom land. Okay. Um, so so <laughs> um, I'll I'll start off. Tid is going to move the slides for me. So um, apologies for me having to ask him to do that every every so often. Um, oh, he's, he's moved one on already. Um, just to say, this is very much um, joint research. So um, Tid and myself are, are presenting today, but um, a large number of people have been involved in that, including um, Professor Neil Sharples, uh, Steve Rippon, um, and uh, Dr. Um, Andy Seaman as well. So um, a huge number of individuals are work uh, a part of this uh, of this project. Um, Tilla, do you want to just move it on? Thank you. Um, so just a bit of background before I hand over to Tilla. As Francis said, we've, we've been working here for a number of years now, so, well, more than a decade. Um, we originally targeted the site because it is a, a very large and nice Iron Age um, hill fort. It's surrounded by the modern housing estates of Cairo and Ely in southwestern um, Cardiff. And all of the work that we've done is part of a big community engagement um, st uh, stroke civic mission um, project by Cardiff University. Um, so all the work we do is co-produced and co-designed, including the pollen work um, that uh, we're going to hear about today. Um, can you move it on, Tid? Um, so whilst we have um, identified um, you know, very significant Iron Age remains, perhaps the most significant um, findings from the excavations have been to reveal that the site is the location of a major Neolithic monument, um, a, a so-called causewayed enclosure. And for those of you who are, are unfamiliar with those kinds of sites, it's basically um, one of the first kind of uh, enclosures of open space anywhere in Britain, built by the first farmers um, in, uh, in Britain in the early Neolithic. Um, now on, uh, on this hilltop, uh, the causewayed enclosure is defined by five ditches, four of which seem to enclose the sort of the western end of the promontory. And you can see those highlighted in red there. Um, on the left hand image and then a much wider ditch um, running around to the east of those which perhaps defines a secondary enclosure or we we're not quite sure if it's two enclosures or one enclosure there may well be further ditches um, to the east but we haven't explored that um, that area through excavation the ditches themselves are very deep they are there, there are gaps between them hence the name causeway and enclosure there's lots of little gaps where people can walk in between these um, ditches um, and they're thought to kind of define a space perhaps for for gatherings so relatively disparate groups um, of early farmers coming together at certain times of the year um, for various activities exchange quasi-religious activity who knows going on up here certainly within the ditches themselves they're crammed full of stuff so Neolithic material culture. So Tid, can you move it on? There we are. So um, yes, yeah, so the, the ditches themselves are, are full of goodies that we can find and tell us lots about the people um, who uh, visited and used this site. Um, so we have uh, a range of lithics and polished stone axes. Um, the pottery assemblage is also, well, is, is extremely significant. It's the largest early Neolithic pottery assemblage from Wales. Um, very large number of vessels. We've done some organic residue analysis on those vessels as well. Um, so, and these ones, similar to those ones you just heard about up north, um, seem to have been used for the processing of dairy products, or most of them are, um, which is quite interesting. We also have eco facts. So um, we know we do have animal bone. It's not particularly well preserved, but we do have animal bones completely dominated by cattle. No other um, species represented. And we also have a small uh, assemblage of carbonized plant remains that includes um, emma, wheat um, and barley um, and a range of wild nuts and, uh, and berries, too. Can you move on? Did in terms of dating, we've done we've got a range of radiocarbon dates which have been uh, modelled by Seren Griffiths, um, which seems to give um, quite a nice tight um, date, date range to the use of this monument. So, broadly speaking, you're looking at a use of use of this site of about 100 years, from about 30, uh, 3500 BC to 3400 um, BC. Um, there is one or two outlier dates which have provided much earlier dates. So, what you know. 
very late neolithic very late mesolithic stroke very very early um, neolithic which must, which are probably residual but do suggest that we've got preceding activity to um, the causewayed enclosure itself can you move on the slide Sid? Um, we've tried to understand the kind of the the sort of the context of this modern the, the landscape context and that's quite difficult given that it's surrounded by housing as you can expect um but we have done various uh surveys we've done a, a test pit project actually during lockdown which identified a number of flint scatters within people's gardens which is quite interesting um, there are a number of known finds as well around the site, some nice polished stone axes which attest to neolithic activity um, in the area um, the best evidence we have of occupation um, isn't a timber hall, unfortunately, but a very um, ephemeral structure under a barrow um, to the northeast, northwest of the site, a sentinel, um, which is associated with bowl type early Neolithic pottery. Um, so possible that that's a kind of a, an early Neolithic occupation site, possible, I would say. Um, but yeah, there are a number of questions that we have about this about this site. And Tid, if you could just move to my final slide before I hand over to you. We really want to know what the kind of the environment was like around this Corsair enclosure when it was being used. What did you know? Was it completely wooded landscape? Were there open elements? How are people utilizing this environment? Um, other questions we had were around kind of when do we actually see the beginning of the Neolithic in this area? That the, the Corsair enclosure is, isn't probably the earliest um, sign of the Neolithic in this in this particular area. So do we have evidence of preceding activity in and around this site? Um, do we even have very late uh, Mesolithic activity? And so the ways to answer these questions are mainly through the pollen evidence, and that's where I'm going to hand over um, to Tida. Thank you, Ollie, and. Let's get this wrong. Okay, so uh, we identified a um, a peat bog that was suitable for pollen sampling, uh, roughly about two kilometres west of um, of Karai Hillpod uh, on the Causeway enclosure. Um, it's a it's a very small bog, measuring about twenty five by one hundred twenty five metres, so should give us a relatively localised pollen signature for the local environment. Uh, currently, it's colonized by trees along its margin, so we couldn't really do much detailed depth probing work around the site because of the, the roots and the vegetation sort of hampering us and the very, very wet surface conditions also hampered us in that regard. Um, but we did manage to get um, a, a central auger uh, trial uh, done here, and that told us we just we had a, a, a central uh, depth of just under four meters uh, in the bog itself. <clears throat> Um, once we retrieved a core from the uh, from the bog, we managed to get uh, a core that was 2.75 meters deep, excavated by hand. Originally, as part of the Manifestations of Empire project, which had a different uh, focus to, to the work we're presenting here. Um, the lower sediments in the in the core were uh, glacial uh, uh, silt um, silt layers. We, we we know this from the radiocarbon dates that we've got from the core. You could also see on the screen here. Um, and the uh, upper peat uh, dates from the Holocene, so we've got 1.88 metres of, of peat uh, still surviving here. Um, the upper peat is relatively loose and we have radiocarbon date reversals there, so uh, that indicates that, that was quite a disturbed sequence, so we, we avoided that uh, for, for our detailed work. Um, um, the sequence survives to, to just into the Iron Age, um, uh, so we had a calibrated date near the top of the core. Uh, of 889 to 567 BC. Um, so our initial pollen analysis for this uh, uh, coring site was focusing very much on the Mesolithic for the Iron Age uh, sediments. <clears throat> pollen, the one in front of you can see a lot of pollen grains of different types, and you can see the pollen grains look very different from plants, uh, from, from, from different uh, types of plants. So. Uh, the idea being that um, we look at our, uh, small samples from our core uh, and a look at the different pollen grains we get in that uh, to see what the environment was like in the past. And by looking through the core, uh, you know, to see differences through time, we end up with something like this. Uh, this is possibly quite a scary looking pollen diagram, um, but you know, it essentially tells you the variation um, in, in by depth of, of your different uh, pollen of different types. And you've you can see the stratigraphy and the uh, radiocarbon dates along the side there, and then the, a summary diagram 
on the bottom, showing you the variation of trees, shrubs, heaths and herbs, and the heaths and herbs being more open in comparison to your, your woodland of your, your trees and shrubs. <clears throat> So the earlier sequence here is very much dominated by woodland, which is quite typical of uh, Mesolithic environments with you know, forests covering the land before humans came along and then started cutting down trees, disturbing the vegetation for various activities. The earliest evidence um, for any disturbance here, it's around 73 centimeters. We see um, evidence for woodland clearance and evidence of, of disturbance uh, from uh, a number of of, uh, of, of species uh, that we, of different pollen types, including cereal type pollen and 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 various other indicators of arable and pastoral activities, um, we still have um, very heavily wooded landscape, but it's it's slightly more open in, on a local uh, scale that, that, than previously. Um, we see uh, once this um, woodland clearance starts, we see a greater variation of pollen types reaching the sampling site, including just different types of woodland uh, uh, pollen types that are reaching the site uh, where before the the, the, the birch pollen that dominated um, um, this 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 locality. So you can see birch on the left hand side there. That's basically filtered out most of the other pollen from reaching the, the sampling site. We do see more substantial woodland clearance and uh, towards the top of the core around the um, eighth or ninth century. Um, we also see associated with that increase in uh, cereal type pollen, other arable indicators and pastoral indicators, uh, which which makes sense in terms of um, it's it's the time we we suspect that the hill fort is is being established, um, and and so in the the increase in in, in arable and pastoral indicators makes sense in terms of what we know about uh, hill forts and the control of um, of uh, farming produce. <clears throat> What some of you who are, who are eagerly, uh, who, who probably more um, more observant, uh, is that uh, have seen is the radar cam dates along the end of the side there. It shows that the evidence for arable activity here is much earlier than expected, uh, but around 400 to 600 years uh, before before current estimates for the onset of the Neolithic period in Wales. In this case, it doesn't appear that the presence of serial type pollen is related to downward movement of material, as there isn't any really obvious evidence for root or insect disturbance in the core itself. Um, and if that was the case, I'd expect the reduction in birch at this level to be more of a, a gradual process rather than the dramatic reduction we see in the pollen record. However, the numbers of serial pollen here um, are extremely low, consisting of one or two grains per sample. And it's difficult to, to support the case for arable activity, given how low the pollen numbers of other uh, uh, indicator species here are as well. So in that case, we we um, we needed to do some more research here. And we were able to proceed with this thanks to a grant obtained from the Cambrian Ecological Association. So we started with um, trying to get uh, more radio calm dates from the site, targeting specifically the levels where we have that evidence of early disturbance and early agricultural activities. Um, we initially tried to sieve those, you know, each centimeter or you know, slice for plant remains um, that we could use for dating, but unfortunately we didn't identify any. In which case, we went with uh, human humic pairs date to get a, a date instead, and then produced the Bayes and Infers depth models uh, for for the core. Now, this is the um, model we produced with the original date before any additional um, samples. Uh, then, this is what it looked like with the addition of the new. Uh, radiocarbon data so you can see um, highlighted in red there. Now you can see there are that some of these, um, you, you can see that uh, they're slightly different from one another, but based on the um, other data we've got from the core, it's quite clear that the one to the left there is an outlier. Uh, and it, the one above it as well, you can see the one that uh, we previously got appears to be an outlier based on the um, based on the Bayesian model here as well. Um, one thing that this, uh, when you include these outlying dates you see on, on the dating model there, it has a drag effect on the dating model. So we run a, a further um, uh, dating model, which with those outliers removed to produce what is more a, a more accurate um, uh, dating model for the site. We then undertook um, more detailed pollen analysis of these uh, deposits trying to see if we can see the origins of these farming activities and see if they genuinely reflect that. Um, so we uh, identified up to a thousand pollen grains from each sample. Um, we 
specifically wanted to try and identify additional serial type grains for statistical analysis and establish the wider environmental conditions uh, from rarer herb types that would be occurring at this site. A serial pollen uh, differentiation from wild glass pollen is, um, it's not a, a very simple process, but they look very sim similar to one another. Um, you can see here from the uh, photographs of both types, they have uh, both of them have either circular or oblong, oblong grain shapes. Um, they have circular uh, pores um, and a, or a single circular pore, I should say, with an, uh, what we call an annulus, a thickened area around that pore. Uh, one of the major differences between most wild grass types and cereal pollen is that cereal pollen is generally bigger in size, both in terms of the size of the grain and the size of the pores. So that's how we differentiate um, steel pollen from wild grass pollen in general, though there is the added complication that some wild grass species do have larger um, pollen grains that overlaps with cereal types. So it's, it, it's, it's not always a, a simple process. This graph shows you the expected size ranges of um, <clears throat> wild uh, grass types in green and, and uh, orange grass types in orange, according to the classifier, uh, classifications of Anderson. Um, he does uh, further distinguish um, uh, cereal types by the hordium group, which is the barley group, which has some um, some some wild grass types in them, so they tend to be smaller gra smaller um, cereal type grains. And then there are larger, um, uh, the larger group is the uh, Avenatriticum, so oats and wheat group. Uh, which has uh, doesn't have many um, wild types at all. It only has one wild uh, type of cereal um, uh, within that classification. So these are the pollen grains that we originally identified in, in the original um, uh, analysis of, of 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 the core. Uh, originally, we we uh, the original dating scheme had these all predating four thousand BC. Uh, the, date, the revised dating model brings that um, indicates that, that they're slightly earlier than that. Sorry, I should uh, I say uh, later in date. Sorry, uh, so the more recent in date. Um, but you can see, general generally speaking, most of the uh, ones we found here are, are um, higher up in the sequence rather than uh, lower down. Um, but with the additional of additional analysis, uh, uh, we undertook we identified uh, you know, forty one pollen grains within this uh, sequence as opposed to eight, which may, gives us more of an idea to base our, our um, analysis um, on and have a better understanding of if they reflect genuine arable activity rather than, than, rather than not. And what we see here is we've got a, a significantly higher number of, of grains keying out as cereal type grains. Um, and significantly, a lot larger, uh, several of them keying out uh, within the um, larger size classification, uh, that are more likely to represent genuine uh, cereal cultivation, uh, and also some of the ones nearer, near, lower down in the sequence as well, the ones that um, more likely to, to date towards this kind of four thousand date date range. Um, that there is this one outlier that's uh, much, much earlier in date, so further down in the core. Uh, we'll just have a look now at, at the environmental conditions um, in, in, in the other environmental conditions that we can see from, from additional pollen grains. So um, that outlying steel grain at 90 centimeters, that's, that's within a section of the core, but still very, very heavily wooded. And there aren't that many other um, um, herb types that uh, are indicative of, of any disturbance of, or, 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 or farming indicators here. The only one we have is from Rumex acetosa, so sorrel, um, which is, is a, a good grazing indicator, but you can't necessarily differentiate that between um, wild um, animal grazing as opposed to grazing with um, domesticated animals. And this contrasts quite a lot with the uh, upper end of this sequence, where we have cereal pollen starting to occur more regularly. Here, in addition to cereal type pollen, we have uh, quite a few other um, arable indicators and, 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 and several um, uh, you know, grazing indicators, possibly even evidence of, of pastoral activity. We also have some wetland indicators and other species that are you know, different quite difficult to place within uh, the whole, whole scheme. 
What is part more significant, though, is that within the serial type brains is the presence of rye uh, pollen. And now rye is uh, a grain that's um, it's more distinctive in its its character. Uh, character uh, it, it, it is an oblong grape chain in, uh, in in comparison to other serial types, which are round. Uh, it's got an analyst diameter of eight to ten centimeters, and significantly, we've got this at uh, 71 and 72 centimeters within our core. Uh, rye isn't introduced as a crop into Britain until much later date, but its presence as a casual weed of cereal cultivation um, it happens much earlier. Therefore, its presence in these samples are very significant, as it's a key taxa for determining the presence of arable activity from pollen analysis. So just to sum up, the revised scheme and the revised dating model for our sequence of interest is much earlier than the original dating model. The first, first convincing evidence of arable activity um, surrounding the site from the presence of larger serial type pollen grains and arable weed starts at a depth of 73.5 centimeters, uh, dating between uh, 4627 uh, to 3646, according to our revised dating model, uh, with a mean date of around uh, 3940. Uh, then the first occurrence of rye. Uh, this occurs in which you're more definitive for arable activity starts at 72 centimeters, corresponding with a date range of uh, 3941 to 3269, with a mean date range of 3688 BC. Of course, these date ranges uh, for the onset of arable activity is very wide because of the sharp nature of the dating curve and the margins of error um, are associated with these levels. However, the radiocarbon dates obtained, which overlaps with these levels, provides a much tighter date, calibrating between uh, 3950 and 3715 BC. And Ollie, I'll just leave you to, to discuss uh, the significance of that. Thanks, Tida. So just to sum up then, so where where, where are we and, and what's the significance of this? Well, if we think about the model um, that we have for the onset of the Neolithic and enclosures in, in South uh, East Wales, um, according to Alistair and, and, and colleagues um, in his gathering time volume, um, they estimate that Neolithic wow. starting in the region from 3765 to 3655 um, Cal BC, so somewhere around, probably around 3700, um, with enclosures like causal enclosures arriving arriving later. Um, and certainly that the Kaya causal enclosure is is later. The Kaya recorded enclosure is is, is 35 um, 100. Sorry, Tid, can you move that on? To the final yeah, brilliant. Um, but right. here we have from the pollen evidence at least some evidence of arable cultivation happening at potentially quite an early date. Um, now, it's not as early as, as some of the recent controversial papers, um, such as uh, uh, Smith et al. Um, talking about um, wheat in the, in the Mesolithic. Um, and I should say as well, we, we, we currently lack the archaeo, we, we haven't got the, the carbonized remains to, to back up this pollen evidence. But it does seem to suggest that we've got arable activity from 3950 to 3715 Cal BC. Now, that does that date range does overlie um, or it falls within um, Whittler Al's um, start of the Neolithic, but only just, only just. And the possibility that we do have the cultivation of cereals at an earlier date than previously expected, I think um, is quite possible. Um, so um, more work needs to be done, but uh, yeah, some quite interesting and exciting results. Um, so thank you very much. And I think there's a, one final slide just to, to acknowledge everyone who's been involved and, and, and very generously um, funded this work. But thank you very much.